Hello to all of you. We're going to get started now. I'd like to thank you for joining us today for our, our webinar, Library as Center for Innovation. I'm Janet Nelson, Director of Library Engagement for DEMCO, and I'll be moderating today's session. Before we get started, I just wanted to go through some housekeeping details, and then I'll introduce our speaker, and she can start today's presentation. On your screen, you should see a chat box on the right-hand side. If you have a question or are having any type of technical issue, please feel free to type something there, and we'll do our best to get back to you as quickly as we can. We will be taking questions at the end of the session, so if something comes up that you'd like clarification on or want to respond to, you can type it into that chat box and we'll be compiling all your thoughts and questions to address at the end of the presentation. If we don't get to your question during the session, we'll be sure to get answers and post them with the recorded webcast after the event. There is also specific contact information available for Tracy and myself that you should see on your screen as well. After the session, you can feel free to email us directly if you have specific questions that we may be able to help with. We're using Twitter today as well, and the hashtag is hashtag Demco Ideas. You should be able to see that hashtag on the side of your screen in the chat box. We are monitoring that feed as well for questions and comments. Just for fun, while I'm doing introductions, we're going to pop up a poll question on your screen to help us better understand today's audience. And our question is, what areas or services are found in your library? And you can choose more than one if you want, or you can mark that none of these apply. So take a look at the options and let us know. Feel free to click on more than one. Now on to introductions. As I mentioned, I'm Janet Nelson, the Director of Library Engagement for DEMCO, and I'm moderating this session. At DEMCO, we're always interested in ways to better serve the needs of our customers, and these webinars have really been a great way for us to connect and provide additional information around important topics for evolving libraries. We are all aware that libraries have been under, undergoing fairly radical changes, and many are working hard to discover how they can best serve their communities. This influences their staff, spaces, programs, and how they communicate with their communities. We are fortunate to have Tracy Lesneski back with us today to share her insights on how libraries are dealing with some of these changes. The two of us have discussed the changing trends and how they're impacting libraries on numerous occasions. Each year we sit down to talk about the newest directions that we're seeing libraries take, and in San Francisco we were discussing collaboration, the maker movement, budding entrepreneurship, and the library's role in economic development of their communities. From there, the concept for this presentation was born. Tracy is head of interiors and a principal for the National Library Architecture and Design Firm, MSR, and she's designed dozen of library interiors across the country. She uses an integrated design approach and factors in users' experience and comfort as well as productivity and aesthetics. Tracy has made a name for herself as an inspiring designer and international speaker, presenting workshops and discussions about library design. She has presented at the ALA Annual Conference for the past four years and recently presented a talk entitled Reset, Transforming Mid-20th Century Libraries to Meet 21st Century Needs at the IFLA Congress in Cape Town, South Africa. She has written articles for New Library World and Library Journal. Tracy is currently chair of the ALA Lama BES Architecture for Public Libraries Committee and also serves on the IFLA Library Buildings and Equipment Section Standing Committee. Before I turn this over to Tracy, I just wanted to show you our poll results. So it looks like most of you are um, doing several of these things in your libraries, though so group study space is obviously coming up the strongest. Um, but that's great news. But hopefully you can find some new new ideas as you as you sit through this particular broadcast. So Tracy, we're going to put the controls into your capable hands and you can get started when you're ready. Great. Thank you, Janet. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you to discuss the library's role in fostering innovation in communities. Whether you're on a campus, uh, in a school, or in a public setting, there should be ideas here today that will apply for you. Uh, with their vast reach into all sectors of society, social, political, uh, occupational, economic, etc., libraries have an incredible opportunity to be a center for innovation. Even with limited dollars and a small amount of space, libraries are often and can be a launching point for creativity and ingenuity. Sometimes all it takes to become inspired or to persuade an idea to gel is introduction and opportunity, and the library offers both in spades. 
gone is the model of a library as a one-dimensional institutional space and a one-size-fits-all experience. Human well-being and engagement is at the center of library design today. To respond, the thriving 21st century library has multiple personalities in, in a good way. At times, a hands-on learning hub may be the predominant vibe, as you see here on the screen. And one quick note, I'll, I'll just mention that all of the slides have the name and place of the, um, of the uh, image in the bottom right-hand corner, so you, if you need to refer to something later, can find where that library was and also who designed it. Um, so as, that was just as an aside. But uh, at times, the hands-on learning hub may be, may be the vibe that the library has. At times, the library may feel more like a shopping mall or a public market with myriad possibilities accessible from, from all vantage points. Sometimes the library is the community's living room and includes spaces and fixtures that even have a residential feel, as you see here. The point is to provide a variety of experiences that support human comfort, health, and well-being, from restorative spaces filled with daylight and view and comfortable seating that feed the spirit to even cafe or coffee spaces that can feed the body. The 21st century library is decidedly multi-dimensional and human focused. Through its varied spaces and experiences, vast resources and technological tools, the library draws people from all sectors of its community in a wonderful mixing pot. The library is perfectly primed to foster creativity, critical thinking, problem solving, and be a center for innovation. And in doing so, libraries become a contributor to a community's cultural vitality, an incubator that creates vital connections between people, and that draws people from the region and beyond, and that spurs economic development. With virtually any information we need available from a phone today, or one day soon a contact lens, like you're seeing on the screen here, the age of information abundance has dramatically changed the skills needed for today's workers and students to succeed. Well beyond the foundational skills of reading, writing, and arithmetic, we need to learn continual innovation. Those who innovate, expand, and improve the status quo are the ones that will thrive. To foster that skill of continual innovation, we need to develop prowess in critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and creativity, often referred to as the four C's. These skills are fundamental to problem solving and innovation. As theoretical physicist Mr. Kaku notes, without innovation we get stagnation. Innovation and problem solving are the fuel that drive our economy and that will lead us through the next wave of technological revolution. When I was thinking about this word innovation that's so pervasive in our culture today, I went to an online dictionary just to see how it was defined and what its synonyms might be. And here are a few on the screen here. Transformation and breakthrough and new methods and revolution. These are all very exciting and energetic um, words. And they got me thinking about how do you create spaces that actually foster these things. And in doing so, I realized that libraries are perfectly primed to support innovation in five key ways, which I'll go through here now, starting with a very obvious one with all the resources, providing access to resources. Text, technology, tactile, talent, and tools. Libraries are filled with resources of all kinds. A library that facilitates ease and comfort in accessing these resources through user-friendly layout, accessible fixtures and display, customer service oriented staff, will grease the road to innovation. Sometimes one just needs to be alone with one's thoughts to let an idea take hold, and libraries have the resource of space and offer the opportunity to be alone or to work with others. The user-directed experience is a very powerful asset in kindling creativity. And this self-direction is perhaps most evident in library maker spaces and production studios where innovation truly thrives. These spaces unite people to interact with individuals possessing talents they may not otherwise encounter in their daily lives. Passionate staff and community members engaged in exciting tactile investigations encourage dialogue and stimulate creativity in others. 
exposure to technologies or tools, even if only through short-term programming, can kindle an idea. Libraries don't have to own every technology or tool themselves. By reaching into the community, you will find passionate people who want to share their interests. And, and sharing their experiences with the library can also grow exposure for their own organization, as well as reaching the community at large. Technologies offered in libraries to help people learn new skills or to be exposed to alternative creative outlets can be as simple as a painted green wall and a computer's built-in camera. It doesn't take a whole lot more than that. A basic study room or a quiet nook can offer the mental space needed to nurture the nugget of an idea. Or for a little different take on the typical study room, you can enliven a brainstorming session by taking the formality out of a meeting. By removing the table, psychologically changing the room from you and me to we. And don't underestimate your own community. Students, engaged citizens, people with just an interest in certain technologies, staff with lateral outside interests. All of these people help broaden the concept of library outreach and include looking for like-minded partners that can enrich the library experience for its customer base. Think of each space in your library as a tool and consider how to turn that tool into a multitasking one. These next slides will show how one room became a highly versatile tool for Madison, Wisconsin's Central Library. In it, everything you'll see is scalable. That is, it could be done on a much grander scale or it could be achieved with far less and be just as successful. The first characteristic of a successful multitasking room is that it does not prescribe a particular use. It can be shaped to meet the needs of virtually any kind of program or activity. This, this first slide shows that the numerous ways that this room has uh, contributed to versatility and to innovation, and so I'll pick through each one of them one by one. The first is the room has access to daylight. Now you should see this slide in blue is highlighting the windows that allow both visibility into the room and views out of the room. This generates excitement and interest in the activity or program taking place, but it also strengthens connection to the rest of the library and activity, and in this case, the neighborhood as well. Innovation can certainly happen in a windowless room, but people are proven to focus better with access to daylight and view. Collaboration is often a part of creative, uh, uh, creative endeavors, and that can be noisy at times. The bubbler room at Madison is treated with acoustic walls that help absorb some of that joyful creative energy. Digital tools are present for presentation, for connection to the outside world, and for brainstorming. Our room has daylight present, as I just mentioned, which can be at odds with a projected image unless high-end equipment is used. But by using monitors on the wall instead of projection, the room can have daylight present without degrading the visual uh, of the digital images. And just as important as the digital tools are the analog ones like writable magnetic walls and marker boards. These reinforce the connection between hand and mind, an important aspect of the creative process, and, and they offer an alternative to digital tools for those inclined or uncomfortable using them. Variety and choice are key in fostering creative thinking and breakthroughs. Feeling boxed in or hampered by a lack of uncomplicated tools can restrict the flow of ideas. Likewise, feeling as though the room is too precious or breakable, that one must be overly careful not to ruin it, can inhibit inventive thought. Highly cleanable and durable surfaces are key. Flexibility in the room layout is also key. The bubbler room can easily move from large lecture format to an artist studio easily and quickly through furniture that is lightweight, height adjustable, and on casters. And since that furniture is able to be cleared out of the room, it needs a space to be cleared too. So adjacent storage convenient to the room means time isn't wasted moving furniture throughout the building. And sometimes invention is messy, literally messy. Providing easy access to water and a deep sink for cleanup can be beneficial. 
The bubble room also contains cabinets for supplies, storage, and the magnets and markers for the writable walls. Keeping tools at hand allow people to stay in the flow and not risk losing a critical thought. Again, all of these aspects of the bubbler can be scaled to meet your library's budget or space availability. Another way that libraries support innovation is by offering proximity to places and to people. Most libraries are located centrally to their campus or in the heart of the city. And this proximity to the energy of a place is inspiring and energizing. In a world where technology can isolate us or at the very least distract us from being mindful of our immediate surroundings, libraries that leverage external amenities can amplify their offerings or prepare the mind for a vibrant, collaborative social experience. Your campus library may be next to a science building with a STEM lab, for example. Creative energy can be brought to both buildings through joint programming or through bringing some aspects of the STEM lab into the library. San Francisco, you know, Janet mentioned that we were recently there together, so I thought this was apt to use as an example. San Francisco's main library sits in a vibrant city civic center, which includes city government buildings, cultural offerings, and a community garden. This vibrant center presents the opportunity to meet and mix with people one might not see otherwise, and to be exposed to things that one might not be in one's daily life. In a similar vein, innovators can motivate one another by working near each other. Libraries often serve as meeting spaces and offices for local startups, for coworkers, for professionals. Um, they're increasingly a co-working location. Academics and professionals use the library for research. They may hold workshops on innovative topics that inspire others. And whether or not you're partaking in the workshop, being exposed to it through um, walking past or seeing it can also be an inspiring. The buzz of a hackathon in the meeting room or the hype of a surrounding an author's talk can also contribute to the energy and hum of a place. 21st century libraries house or host complementary partners that bring new visitors to the building and introduce fresh ways of defining what a library is to a community, which leads to increased traffic and increased vitality. And by offering the ability to learn and partake from the periphery, you can imagine that those two with their coffee cups are just walking by and saying, wow, this is happening outside the library. That's pretty cool, and wanting to come back again. That ability to partake from the periphery is important. Not everyone enjoys being right in the thick of things, which is going to lead me to the third way that libraries support innovation. By providing an, an experience variety of options and offerings. The 21st century library offers a variety of space types from vibrant, open, collaborative spaces to very quiet nooks and private study areas. Having the flexibility to move between these spaces as suits the task at hand or the mood can very much help the creative process. The library is all of these things and more on the, on the screen here. For example, innovation may require collaborative work, the vetting of ideas through a simple meeting, Or it may need some tools to collaborate, to refine, to discuss some thoughts or proposals and practice that art of collaborative, collaborative work, one of the four C's. Access to technology and space to spread out in an enclosed room for a heated debate, like you see at the back of this slide, may be what's needed to spawn the next innovation. Being able to close a door and feel that you're not um, Bothering those around you is, a, is an empowering thing. And sometimes we just need heads down work. We want to be on the periphery of the hum of a public space like a coffee shop. Um, but libraries offer this in their own ways, including by providing little nooks or niches, or in this case, fixtures that help us get out of that public space but still feel part of the, the whole. And this ability to be next to the hum but not directly in it may help an idea to coalesce. 
where we talked about proximity being inspiring, sometimes it's also detrimental. Sometimes people just need solitude. And so many libraries offer study rooms and spaces where people can get away from everyone and shut the door and have that quiet that they so need. Sometimes we just need a jolt of caffeine. And a cup of coffee in the library cafe can help us crack a particular problem. And sometimes a chain of, change of scenery helps us get the juices flowing. A garden or a gallery where people can lose themselves for a time can rejuvenate the soul and help crystallize our thoughts. Along these same lines of choice and experience is freedom. And this is may, perhaps the most difficult of the five to talk about. Um, freedom refers to the uh, ability of somebody coming to a public place and not being inhibited in their behavior. And not in a disruptive way, but in a way that um, allows them to explore new ideas and to, to uh, engage in collaborative collisions with others to spark new, new thoughts and new um, excitement around an idea. Because unlike the home or the office or school, this, quote, other space of the library does not prescribe a particular behavior. Everybody comes to the library to do something different. And you see that when you come to a library. And so it's apparent by the very nature of the building that there's no prescription for how you should behave. In the library, users have freedom from the baggage that lingers in other places of our typical routine. We don't have to look at the dishes in the sink. We don't have to think about the budget figures that are due in a week. The library provides that mental space and freedom to experiment with ideas or new technologies and to seek assistance when needed and fail in anonymity. The joy possible in a freedom to express oneself and to experience others' self-expressions is evident in this interactive exhibit at the Madison Central Library. This wall is part of the main gallery on one of the floors of the library. And one of the, um, one of the programs that was run by the library was to clear this wall of, of other art, provide a couple of questions to answer, a few pair of scissors, and some magazines and, and imagery. And that's all it took to get members of the community engaged in a robust community conversation. The ethos of freedom to participate and to engage with others can be a very powerful contributor to innovation. The idea of a library belonging to its community is very powerful. Demonstrating this by offering spaces that are non-precious, that can be owned by a group or a shared experience for a time, can lead to a transformative thinking and to creative collisions, as I mentioned before. And you see from this slide here on Chattanooga's fourth floor that it really is just a concrete floor and an open space that's allowing people to bring what they want into this building to make, um, make uh, opportunities for innovation and new ways of thinking about uh, old ideas. It also can house interactive art that pushes the mind to new places. The same space that we were just looking at here now inhabits this exhibit with a, it's a collaborative sculpture where somebody uh, bicycling is uh, causing air to blow up these little rooms that people can walk into. And while that may seem like a simple thing not really related to innovation, it's just these sorts of unexpected um, opportunities that aren't requiring very much from the library, aside from, from space and the ability to find someone to do an exhibit, that uh, allow people to uh, transform their thinking and ask great questions that can lead to innovative um, answers, pushing our mind to new places. A critical aspect of freedom to create is the ability to self-organize. And this applies to giving staff the ability to change up the spaces serving themselves or the spaces serving public through flexible spaces and furniture. 
Um, and it also applies to the people that are coming to the library, of course. But we often forget about the innovators in the staff themselves. So as a center for innovation, we should be thinking of it as both public and staff who are um, learning to innovate and bringing innovation to their communities. Libraries that are centers for innovation provide spaces that can be customized by visitors to the library for short and long-term use. This is that same bubbler room that you've seen before in four very different modes. One is a brainstorming session. One is a presentation with a display from an artist who's a visitor. Uh, one is where it looks more like an office. And another is more of an event. And all of these things are done using the tools that I mentioned before, the fabric walls, the whiteboards, the monitor, the flexible furniture, the cleanable surfaces. Um, and they all exude non-preciousness. That is, people coming to inhabit these spaces know by looking at it that it's OK to move these things, and it's OK to make the space themselves their, their own. And further, that if they spill their coffee on the floor, they don't need to worry about it because it easy, is easily cleaned. If they mark a surface of the table, it's OK because it can be cleaned. And so this freedom to self-organize and to inhabit a space really helps support brainstorming, helps support collaboration, and helps support transformative thinking because you aren't worried about controlling so much of, this, of the experience of that room. Having a place in one's life where there's freedom to experiment is critical. Escaping from our typical surroundings can loosen the mind, can provide fuel for innovation. Attaining a state of flow requires a stress-free environment, and it requires the confidence in your ability to complete a task. Play, as we've learned, helps us burn off stress, and play helps us develop confidence in our abilities. And the 21st Century Library is as much a place for play as it is for traditional learning. I was thrilled when I came across this photo. This is, again, the Madison Library in Wisconsin, of them using the third floor space, which had been previously conceived of as a, an event space, kind of a, a pristine, in a way, event space. And yet they felt um, free enough to turn it into a place for a Pinewood Derby. And you can imagine how surprising and delightful that would be for people coming to this event or coming to the library and seeing this um, opportunity to, to participate in a Pinewood Derby in a space that is often used for very formal events. And this is the kind of freedom that I'm, that I'm talking about. And this leads me to the fifth and perhaps most important way that libraries are centers for innovation. They provide inspiration in a myriad of ways. As cultural hubs for their communities, 21st century libraries offer inspiration through materials, through the programming that they provide, through access to visual arts and makerly activities, and through public art as well. Um, public art can be as simple as a wall with uh, outreach to artists in the area who are more than happy to hang their own shows, oftentimes in public buildings, because they want that exposure. And uh, public art can be something that's more embedded and part of the architecture. Either way, public art is a very important aspect of, of all libraries. As a community nexus, and as I mentioned before, often libraries are located in the hearts of their campuses or in the centers of their communities. As that nexus, they are a perfect place to engender serendipitous encounters between people who might not meet otherwise. And these creative collisions, as I've called them before, can trigger fresh ideas and create networks amongst people that may not have known one another before. Public art can also create awareness of the world around us. Like this sculpture by Ned Kahn that changes with the wind it inspires questions about materiality, about the solidity of architecture, about the environment at large, and the opportunity to infuse buildings that are used by many different publics um, with public art, I think, is, is really can't be overstated in terms of the responsibility of a library to contribute to that conversation. 
that really will help um, people feel inspired and free those um, thoughts that help people to uh, innovate. Libraries, of course, offer space for experts to share their knowledge. That's nothing new. It just bears repeating that um, the opportunity for people to come in and meet with other aspects of their community, to share what they know, demonstrate what they know, and do this in a fluid way is a very important aspect of how to contribute to those four C's. Flipping the idea of library on the side, or on its head, by turning it into a nightclub or a music venue can bring new users into the building. It may not have to be a nightclub or a music venue. It may be something different for your own campus or your own community. The point is, increasing the library's vibrancy, increasing the number of ways that people define library, promotes a community ethos for the building and prompts return visits after exposure to those myriad offerings. It causes people to wonder what else might be happening at the library and what else might I be able to learn and contribute on my own um, as a result of those offerings. The building itself can inspire sustainable features such as green roofs or photovoltaic panels in a public building will teach new generations how to build responsibly. Um, didactic uh, opportunities as well as embedded opportunities such as this one um, can hopefully motivate people to improve upon the current best practices, to begin to ask questions and um, cause them to innovate. These kinds of experiences paired with very targeted programming or resources that are collected in a way that um, offers opportunities for those kinds of uh, interactions to, to promote a discussion around sustainability is a really wonderful opportunity to help us all learn how to do better and to innovate in a place that our world sorely needs innovation. And buildings can inspire simply by being well designed and filled with delightful moments. This is a library in China and it creates the feeling of being in a treehouse. It's covered with sticks on the outside and glass on the inside. It has no electric light, so it closes when it gets dark. But um, the spaces inside of it are, are really like being in a treehouse. It's a wonderful inspiration. And so this is a good example of something that is of, of another kind of experience for someone throughout their day. It's very different from a typical office or a typical gym or a typical campus uh, building, institutional building. Um, offering moments like these can be very inspiring. And this light wall at Madison uh, Library in Wisconsin, again, invites imagination, creates a buzz of activity around the exterior of the library. The library has always been a place for innovators and ideas to flourish. And vibrant libraries have always contributed to economic development by encouraging connections and helping people learn and get the resources that they need. The idea of a library as a center for innovation is simply embracing that ethos and aligning the library's identity with 21st century needs. And Janet, I'm going to turn it back to you now so we have plenty of time for questions. Great. Thanks for the, your insights, Tracy. That, that's very helpful. Um, we do have a number of questions, and if people have additional questions, we're going to have quite a bit of time here to be able to answer those, so you can keep sending those in. Uh, I'm going to start off with one that's pretty lighthearted. Uh, there's curiosity around how the library can be used as a wedding venue. Oh, okay. Well, that is something that we're seeing increasingly, actually. And um, the use of the library as a wedding venue is um, a fairly simple endeavor. It involves offering the kind of space that would attract people. Um, and it offers the ability to get people in and out of it during off hours, if you will, um, without having to um, traipse through the entire building itself. So in the example where I was showing the Pinewood Derby, if I still have control here, right, Janet? I can actually go back to that slide. Um, this space is an event space that has a secure stair 
and elevator so you can get up to the space when the library itself is closed, meaning that all the materials and technologies and things that are part of the library proper are protected um, when this is being used after hours. Um, the furniture is able to be cleared out of there to make space for events. And they have set up um, a pretty robust set of, of um, policies, of um, uh, information regarding you know, food and drink. They have paired with certain people in town that provide catering when, they, when there is an event at their building. And I know that they have that posted online somewhere. This is the Madison Central Library, as you can see on the bottom of the slide. Um, so I don't know if that's answering the question exactly, but it really um, is as simple as having a space that's designed in such a way that it makes people want to be there. I think that's perfect, Tracy. Um, if anybody else has any further questions on that, then you can certainly feel free to, um, to send that in and we can further clarify that. Uh, we are going to move on to um, how do you keep the library clean when offering messy activities? So there's a, a few things to keep in mind with this. If you're working with an existing condition, it may be that you need to think about where you are going to provide these kinds of activities. So if you have a choice between a space that is filled with soft, plushy carpet or a space that has vinyl tile, you would opt for the space with vinyl tile. Um, but there are many different kinds of um, materials out there that are both comfortable to stand on and, and use and contribute to the acoustic quality of a space and yet offer cleanability and durability. Um, I think it's important to have a space somewhere. It doesn't have to be large. It can be a small corner of a, of a place where people um, do have the freedom to be a little bit messy. And it might be as simple as those, um, those mats that you can put under a desk for your roller chair, for your task chair to roll over. Um, it might be as simple as layering a few of those underneath a table, um, if that's what you can do. Or it might be putting craft paper out on the floor or on a table so that the table or the floor can, can take some additional abuse. That's if you have to multitask a particular space. If you're able to design from the ground up, then I think being very mindful of the myriad activities that would take place in a particular space is important so that you can be thinking about maybe light fixtures that don't hang down because they might get hit depending on what's happening in there. Or you can think about um, a floor that is very easy to, to uh, clean up and, and mop up when there's been a, a messy activity. Janet? Yep, I'm here. Oh, we just okay. needed to be unmuted. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, that's okay. That's okay. Um, we do have a number of school libraries on today, and okay. there are several questions around that. So I think we will start off with how would you suggest segmenting space when you have, you're limited in the size? And this was specifically from a middle school librarian. Could you repeat that? question, the middle school librarian when you're limited in size and what was the part of the question? This was specifically a middle school librarian that was that was putting forth this question. So um, how do you segment that space if, if you have limited space available? To create a center for innovation? Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, so some of the things that I was just describing about um, multi-use or multi-functioning I think of, if you've ever watched on the Food Network, Alton Brown, he likes to talk about um, the evilness of unitaskers and um, every tool in his kitchen needs to be a multitasker. And that's kind of how I think of the 21st century library, wherever, whatever kind of library you might be, that spaces need to be pressed into multiple types of service. And so if you have only one table and chairs that are available for studying, you, it may be that you need to um, create the space throughout the day when it, when it can be used for innovation or for makerly activities or for um, you know, STEM-related activities. And other times of the day, it's set aside for quiet study or for research or that sort of thing. Um, and so 
it could be that you just need to think about the kind of table, the kind of chairs that would allow for that to take place. It may be that you have um, craft paper on hand, you know, a big roll of, of, um, of newsprint or something that can be spread out over a table. So if it's moving from a clean activity to a messy one, that can be done with simple cleanup. Um, or it may be that uh, you can do some reconfiguring of a space and without seeing it, it's hard, hard for me to, to come up with all the possible maybes here, but um, it may be that a little bit of reconfiguration can help you find more space. Um, sometimes taking a fresh look at what your, what your configuration is, how shelving is located, um, how uh, windows are used or not can help free up space that may have not otherwise been there. And in that case, you can start to provide um, the variety that I was talking about in terms of types of experience. I don't know, did, I, did I get That's to the negative helpful. of that one? I think so. Yes. If, again, if, if there's additional questions around that, feel free to, to send those in. Um, there's, a, there's a number of school ones in here. Um, some of them are related. Um, but this one is, um, how do you envision the role of elementary school libraries moving forward? How do I envision the role of elementary school libraries moving forward? Right. Um, well, I think like many school libraries, and, and actually I, I don't know that I see a huge distinction, and, and for that you may want to um, text you a, a follow-up question if I don't get, get at what you're asking, but I think all libraries on campuses or schools or in publics need to further embed themselves into the daily lives of people. Um, we are inundated with information and we are inundated with opportunities to partake of so many different things right now that sometimes it's hard to see the forest through the trees. And so by becoming a very important go-to, by thinking about what it is we need on the various journeys of our life, including when we're small children, moving through middle school, high school, university, etc at all those different stop points of our lives, our needs around how we um, use and access knowledge are going to continue to change and evolve. And as elementary age children, I think of those as being opportunities to expose um, children to the kinds of things that they're going to need to master um, to thrive in the world that they eventually become an, an adult in. And everything's pointing to mastery of um, visual literacy, mastery of, of finding and um, mashing up and integrating technologies, mastery of the sciences, um, because everybody seems to be pointing to nanotechnologies and, and those uh, aspects of our world as the next frontier. Um, as, as exposure to those things to generate excitement and to generate a joy in learning about um, those kinds of aspects. But now that I've said all of that, I also think that the elementary school library is first and foremost a place to, um, and this is not a change, this is just a reiteration of what I think it has been, a place to engender a true love of learning and a true love of reading and uh, as a way of learning. Um, my own children are in an elementary school, and I think of of what I would love to see for their school library in terms of a place for them to have a little part of their day that feels like an oasis and that they're excited about um, exploring and coming away with, with new worlds in their hands that they can bring home. And so that was a little bit of a ramble. But no, I, I think that was a great question. No, I think you definitely did, and, and I think it's important that all of us think about the fact that 
that all libraries are at the heart trying to do something very, very similar. And it doesn't really matter whether you're a school or a public or an academic. And I see all these worlds coming closer and closer together as the years pass um, and really having opportunities to work together too um, to, be, to make spaces and programs that are inspiring to all of their users. So I think you, you hit it on the head. So um, this one is an interesting one that I, I think that you'll be able to address. Um, when you were showing the bub bubbler room um, and kind of the pieces that went together there, um, the question was, is the bubbler room a package or offered with options and potential to purchase more as funding and space come together? Well, the bubbler room is, is the branded term that that particular library use, uses for their um, program that's actually system-wide and happens to have a home base at the Central Library, which we were involved with, and w which is why I show these images, because um, I think it helps me talk about what we think about in terms of spaces that support innovation and creativity. So I don't think you would necessarily have to quote, purchase, or specify, or design every single one of those aspects um, as a completed package. I think you could phase that in if, if for example, the, the person asking this question has an existing um, meeting room that has some but not all of those aspects. I think a lot of what is achieved can still, um, can still happen there. And so, um, it's an interesting idea, actually, to consider the bubbler room as a as a package that can just be <laughs> bought like a library in a box kind of thing. Um, but what I would start with, I think, if I if I had limited resources and limited space, what I would start with is this premise that it shouldn't be precious, and that as best as possible, it needs to be the most flexible tool that it can be. So that the lighting isn't, um, you know, directed in a particular way that makes you not be able to do other things, or that, um, you know, the furniture is hardwired into the floor. I would, I would try to free everything, kind of untether everything as much as possible, and start there, and then start adding in some of these other aspects that I mentioned. You know, we don't have to have a storage closet off to the side. You can actually have tables or chairs that stack and fold and can just be tucked into a corner, for example. Um, so I think there are things that you can do that don't require buying, quote, the whole package of something like the bubbler room. Right. I, I think that that, um, that is a great concept or layout that people can kind of use as a framework to build on, um, but they can really take into account what their, their individual needs are for each particular space. So um, another question right. that we have, um, in your experience, have you seen grants available for creating these types of innovative spaces? Absolutely, yes. There are, there are grants available out there. There's a lot of competition for them right now, however. Um, but I think the, the key that we've seen with clients who've gone after these kinds of grants is to frame it in such a way that, it, that the idea itself sounds innovative. So, um, you know, saying I would like to create a makerspace because that's what libraries are doing is, is not going to get you there anymore. That might have, you know, a few years ago when makerspaces were a little bit of a novelty. But by talking about how innovation is at the heart of driving our, our global econ economy, but how it fits into your local economy, whether that economy, I mean, I use that broadly, is, is the economy of a campus, um, you know, in terms of, of the output of the students and setting them up well for the future, or whether it's literally the commerce of a small downtown for a, a small community library framing it in such a way that it shows the impact that a library is going to have on its community and its region is going to be a very important way to have your proposal for those kinds of grants rise to the top. Very helpful. Um, I know that that's a very, very common question that we get and in a number of different fronts, um, and it's always interesting to see what, what available out there. Um, in addition, there there is on the 
idis.dumco.com site, um, there is a grant search tool on there. You can just go in and put grants into the search box and you should come up with a tool that can help you look for some of those things as well. It won't be all inclusive, but it's at least a place to start. Um, okay, another question that we have, this one's kind of interesting. Are there specific wall color combinations that, that tend to inspire innovation? No, that's a very good question. Um, you know, it's, it's the, co the concept of color, the topic of color is always a very um, difficult one because people from different cultures have different reactions to specific colors or um, people have different experiences with colors. You know, blue may be a very calming and wonderful color for some somebody, but it may be a color that makes somebody else uh, feel uh, tired or, or uninspired. And so color can be a very difficult thing. And so how I tend to think about spaces that are set up well for innovation is, um, well, first of all, the variety that I mentioned before is so important to have that. that you, you just inherently have the ability to move from a place to, to a different place and get a different kind of experience, no matter the scale of your library. Um, but the, if you're thinking about setting up a, a, an innovation room or a maker kind of lab or a production studio, the thing that I try to think about most is not interfering. So kind of quietly fading to the background to let whatever the activity is take the stage. Um, so rather than, you know, paint it all red to get people excited and, you know, get blood pressures going <laughs> or uh, blood uh, pressures rising, instead of thinking about the room that way, I tend to think about how can how can the walls be writable um, to let people get ideas out as quickly as they can, or how can we, we use technology in a smart way to make sure that it's you know one touch and it's and it's going so it's convenient, and how can we light a particular area so that it feels like a good spot to kind of perch and collaborate and sit for a bit while you let an idea. Um, uh, take 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 form. Um, so for me, it's less about infusing a space like that with a bunch of color, and more about infusing it with the programmatic tools that allow um, that kind of work to blossom. Great advice. Um, that. That's something that we can all take to heart because I know it's easy to, to want to throw a bunch of color out there and um, you kind of forget about the fact that there's other things that you're wanting to highlight within that space. So this one, I know you're not a librarian, so but mm -hmm. you work with a lot of libraries and I know that staffing is always something that you're, you're thinking about when you're developing some of these spaces. Uh, so the question that came in is how do you manage the regular library responsibilities while also providing these activities? Do you hire an additional event staff just for those events? Are they library assistants or librarians or event planners? Or is this the new skill that is added to already current staff uh, to make time for this as well as yeah. other responsibilities? So what have you seen? Well, what I'm seeing um, is kind of a two-pronged approach. One is reaching out into the community, as I was describing earlier, to find partners who are engaged citizens and want to contribute because it's surprising how many people out there, if asked, want to participate. And so there are, if you're in a university town, for example, there are students who are just looking to practice skills and to learn and to get access to technologies that they wouldn't have otherwise. And so they're going to be very willing to come in and help you. Um, if you uh, have staff that have particular passions, lateral kinds of things that are complementary, that's also oftentimes a good place to start because if they're passionate about something, they're going to be more willing to um, maybe change what their job description is or morph it or take on something in addition to a more traditional kind of role. And then the other, so that's, that's one. One is that outreach that I was describing before about kind of connecting with and finding in your network who are the people that can help um, because it's it it really is remarkable how many people want to be part of something that's um, successful exciting innovative new and bring their own talents to bear 
um, especially with the, the change in, in growing baby boomers, uh, you know, the generations that we keep hearing about, the mixing of generations right now is really wonderful uh, it, with this large population that's kind of coming to terms with whether they're ready to leave the workforce wholeheartedly or not and, um, and what impact that has on volunteerism and on, um, uh, you know, just giving back to communities. So that's one prong. The other prong, though, is I, I, this is, again, Janet, I'm so glad you said you're not a librarian and, and qualified at first because I always hesitate to say something like this, but it's what I'm seeing from my, my vantage point is that um, librarianship is changing. The skill sets that are needed are, are shifting and growing. And so I think that these kinds of spaces are not a fad. I think that the idea of library as a center for innovative activity, economic growth, um, these aren't necessarily new ideas, but I think what's new is that libraries and librarians are needing to be much more aggressive and proactive about contributing than they maybe have been in decades past. And so I think that is, is going to compel a broadened skill set. Great advice. Um, lots of new things happening, and we all have to think about things a little bit differently. So I'm going to have one last question before I wrap up here. Um, and this question is something that I think we'll talk about it, but um, we can compile something, but I just want to get your feedback if you have some things off the top of your head. Um, this one says, the examples are all very inspiring. Are there sites that compile innovative library adventure space ideas that you could recommend? Just hearing what other libraries do is very useful. Um, well, there's, there's the Library as Incubator project. They have a website and they're on Facebook. Um, the Bubbler at Madison is always posting great things about what they're up to. So that's, um, you can either get there through the Madison, Madison Public Library website or you can search Bubbler and you'll find it. Um, Janet mentioned that I'm on the committee for IFLA's building and equipment um, section. We have just started a Facebook page. Um, so it's IFLA Building and Equipment, I think, I-F-L-A-L-B-E-S. -E um, if you search that, if you're on Facebook, um, we're constantly posting um, imagery and ideas about libraries there. It's just getting started, so give us some time, but, but we're getting some traction with that. Um, ALA has, of course, uh, a, a lot of resources on their own website. Um, and then I do have a short list of websites that I often refer to, and so I would be happy to put those into an email to Janet if there's a way for Janet to either post or get them out to the people who've attended, I'd be happy to provide that. Great. Those are those are great resources. Um, and we will pull together um, what Trace is talking about and some of these that she just mentioned into a resource list, and we'll make that available with the webinar um, documents um, on the, the ideas.demco.com site. Um, and that particular site, too, is another place that you can use as a resource because we are always trying to to put ideas about um, what libraries and librarians are, are doing with their, their spaces or their programs or um, things like that. There's lots of other webinars out there. Um, so just a lot of different, different ideas that you can gather from that site as well. Um, so we'll make that available as a resource. So I'm going to wrap things up. I'd like to really thank Tracy for sharing our insight and ideas around how we can be looking at the library as a center for innovation. Um, I think we're all kind of feeling that that, um, that movement afoot. So we hope that everyone was able to take away a few new ideas to try. Um, there are some great discussion and we appreciate all of you sharing your time with us. You'll be receiving a survey at the end of the webinar to let us know how we did. Please take a few moments to fill that out. We really love your feedback so that we can make these sessions even better in the future. So feel free to comment on other topics that you'd like more information on or speakers you'd like to hear from so we can consider building some of these things into our future schedule. Um, we've received really great feedback from our previous webinars that's helped us to focus on the topics that you're all most interested in. A recording of this webcast will be available on the Demco Ideas and Inspiration website by tomorrow, 
Um, so it's ideas.demco.com. Or if you can't remember that, um, the site can be accessed through the demco.com website as well. So if you missed something or just wanted to review, you can go back and refresh yourself on the presentation or share it with your colleagues. So next week, you'll be receiving an email that will include resources such as the slides, a Q&A log that documents the answers and uh, um, the questions that came up today. So anything we didn't get to, we will definitely get answered there. Um, and again, thank you for joining us today. Please consider joining us on December 2nd at 1 p.m. when Carson Black of Carson Black Consulting and Tony Medrano from Boopsy present Trends and Best Practices to Ease Mobile Technology Integration. So keep watching the Ideas and Inspiration site for other new webinars, and you can also find many that are available on demand to watch at your convenience. We hope you'll consider joining us for future events. Again, so glad you joined us today, and hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.